council term, a town council meeting, May 11th, uh, 1992. I would begin the meeting this evening by asking our town clerk uh, to call the roll. Chairman Creelman? Here. Councilor Amaro? Here. Councilor Coxall? Here. Councilor Chapel? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McLaughlin? Here. And Councilor Pearson? Here. Very good. I would now ask you all to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda are the minutes of meeting number 14 held on April 13th, 1992. What is your desire? It's a challenge. I'll move that they be accepted as printed. Second. Second. Okay. Move to accept the minutes uh, as they stand and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Vote is 7 to 0. Thank you very much. At this point, I would ask that uh, any citizens who have an item that they would like to share uh, with us this evening that is not formally on the agenda, uh, could I please uh, see a hand if anyone has a desire to come forward and address uh, a particular item that is not on our agenda? Seeing no hands, I will close that portion of the meeting. At this time, I'd like to open up a section of the meeting entitled Reports and Correspondence. And I will begin myself this evening by thanking all of the uh, voters in Cape Elizabeth who voted at our uh, recent municipal election on May 5th. Uh, 1,456 votes were cast. And on the town council, uh, William Jordan was returned to us for an unprecedented 10th term. Uh, we're delighted that Billy will continue to be working with us and also uh, Dick Dahlbeck, uh, whom I think is somewhere out there in the crowd this evening, was also, thank you Dick, was also elected to the uh, town council for a three-year term. On the school board, Ann Chapman and Charlie Greer were returned uh, to the school board. Congratulations to you both. At this time, uh, this is a sad evening for us. Uh, Councillor Amaro is here for the last time for a while, anyway. Uh, Jane has uh, really uh, given a tremendous amount of her time and her life to uh, municipal government and school uh, body in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, she is this evening finishing up uh, nine years on the town council and six years on the school board. And uh, to our recollection, she may be, now I may stand corrected, but she may be the only citizen to have chaired both groups. Someone can correct me if that's not true. Uh, Jane has done so much, and I just want to underscore some of the uh, variety of commitments that she has uh, taken charge of and been a part of over the years uh, in Cape Elizabeth. She was co-chair of the first Family Fun Day, and she was marshal uh, of a later Family Fun Day, uh, apparently displaying baton-twirling <laughs> skills that have yet to be uh, improved upon. Uh, Jane served as president of the Greater Portland Council of Governments uh, during very, very difficult budgetary times. Uh, she's been active in the League of Women Voters. Uh, while on the school board, she helped to form the community services program. She is currently the chair of the state board of education. Jane has always fostered the one town concept. She was a prime mover for the establishment of our cable access station. Uh, she developed our current appointments committee process. And she served on councils that decided to expand the Thomas Memorial Library, purchase the community center, acquire the keeper's quarters at Portland Head Light, move forward with the Southern Cape Sewer Project, 
uh, reconstruct the tennis courts and construct the community track. And she was also the last counselor serving who selected the current town manager and who confirmed four department heads. Uh, at times, we continue to question her judgment. Uh, she helped form uh, the Charter Review Committee, uh, the Comprehensive Planning Commission, the Town Center Planning Committee, the Affordable Housing Committee, the Municipal Facilities Committee, the Harbor Commission, the Arts Commission, and uh, she even became a grandmother while serving <laughs> on the council. Uh, we will miss Jane's balanced insight, her voting record, always characterized by fairness, uh, her commitment to doing her homework, uh, and her commitment to all of us who have served with her. Uh, we wish you well, Jane, uh, as you hopefully continue your public service to Cape Elizabeth uh, in the main Senate. Thank you very much, Wayne, and fellow counselors and uh, members of the audience. Uh, it is kind of a sad night for me, but also a happy one because uh, I really feel that 15 years of service uh, as a local town official has, uh, it's been a long time, uh, but it's been a very memorable one. And there's one thing about working with the people of Cape Elizabeth, uh, they're always cooperative, they're reasonable. Uh, they're willing to do the work and put in the time uh, to serve on the committees, and it's been a great town to represent all these years, and, and I'm really proud to have had the honor of uh, serving you for such a long time. I want to also congratulate uh, uh, the uh, people who won in the local election last week. But I also want to congratulate all of the candidates, because I think once again we were really fortunate in this town to have such a great slate of candidates to choose from. And I leave this position knowing that uh, uh, Dick Dahlbeck is going to do a great job. And uh, I know that the other candidates who ran hopefully will run again another time because they certainly also have a lot to offer. Uh, and with that, thank you all for all of those memories. I'd forgotten that that much had happened. <laughs> uh, but it ha it's been, it's been a, a great 15 years. And I really look forward to using all these skills I've gained, hopefully about 60 miles north of here in Augusta in another year or so. Thank you all. Thank you. Let us continue here with our uh, section on reports and correspondence. I see Councillor McLaughlin. I'm waiting for somebody else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wanted to report for the public, I know this was in the newspaper, but we talked last month about the um, resolution of the Portland Water District rate case. I'm sure you read in the paper that that was resolved. There still will be a differential between the town and city rates, but it's not as large a differential as had been projected. And there is a freeze on the cost of the fire hydrant rates. Looking at figures that have been prepared for us by the town manager, if we look at the savings to both the town and to the citizens on your individual water bills, we are looking from when we started this last summer with a petition drive that a lot of you helped out with and signed <coughs> those petitions, looking forward through November 1992, we're recognizing a savings of over $188,000. I think that's very significant for all of us, and I again want to thank all of you who participated in helping us make those gains. We are not done with this, probably, and we may be hearing more about this when another rate increase is being proposed. I also wanted to report to the Council that I took the opportunity on April 23rd to attend a breakfast presentation um, sponsored by the Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce. Councillor Amro was there also with one of her different hats, I believe your State Board of Education hat that day. And former Councillor Penny Carson was there also. We had a very interesting <laughs> breakfast that morning. The presentation was about the Michigan worker, workers' compensation system and was put on by three members of the ad hoc labor management group of which our own town manager was a member. The presenters were Ned McCann from the main AFL-CIO, 
Bob Hodges of Nichols Portland and Jim Mackey, who's chief steward of the local S6 at Bath Iron Works. I found it very informative. I felt it was helpful for me as a counselor to understand better what the Michigan system entails. It sounded like there was a good degree of cooperation between labor and management. Um, one of their emphases is to put people back to work as quickly as is appropriate. It seems to be a bit faster than what happens in Maine right now. They have a very low litigation rate and they have a competitive and profitable insurance market. I know our counselor-elect, Mr. Dahlbeck, is on the Governor's Blue Ribbon Commission that is looking at workers' comp and don't ever expect to be as informed as he is, but I found it was a good educational experience to be there. At the last executive committee meeting of COG on April 22nd, there was a presentation about collective bargaining and labor negotiations. Um, again, CAPE had good representation there because our manager attended the meeting, as did I. The speakers were Roger Kelly, who's a labor relations consultant with Drummond <coughs> Woodson, Plimpton and McMahon, and Ernie Canelli, who is the business agent for Teamsters Union 340. It's interesting to hear both sides of negotiation um, tactics, and I found it, as I said, very educational helped reinforce for me the needs that this council has to bring ourselves up to speed in some negotiation ideas and such. And I hope this is something, I know this is something we're going to be moving forward on um, later in this calendar year. Another thing done at that COG executive meeting was to approve the budget. I know you'll all be pleased to know that there is a $50,000 being appropriated to the fund balance at COG this year. The budget is on the positive side of the line, which is extremely good news. There was something before you this evening, which you may have also received at home, about the J Thursday, June 11th COG meeting. I hope a lot of the counselors here can attend that. Another thing that we received was requests for nominations for the COG Regional Recognition Awards. And if anybody in the town and the audience here tonight are watching on television has suggestions for that. What they're looking for is any, ci any citizen of the region who is eligible as long as they meet the criteria of having given of their time and talents for the betterment of their own community as well as the region as, uh, as a whole. So I would say if anybody has nominations, please be in touch either with me or with the manager. And one last thing, I was very impressed to note on cleanup week a couple of weeks ago, we had the most calls since this has been recorded since the spring of 1988, 689 calls. I know one of those was for a, my neighbor and I took down a fence, and I personally appreciate cleanup week, and apparently a lot of other people do too. I'm glad we can still do that. Thank you. Thank you. Other reports and correspondence. Mr. Chairman, you have it in your file there on the RWS meeting of April the 23rd, but for the record, uh, we voted to put before the communities a uh, change in the uh, bylaws to uh, admit one more town and reapportion the votes for the 1990 census and increase the board of directors from 25 to 28. I thought we might have that on the record. It does not affect Cape Elizabeth. We still have one member on the board and one vote. Thank you. Thank you. Other reports and correspondence. Okay, seeing none, I will close this portion of the meeting and proceed now to our uh, first public hearing of the evening. Uh, the general fund budget, fiscal year 1993. This is item 161 uh, to consider the adoption of fiscal year 1993 general fund budget and take any necessary action. I will defer to the uh, chair of our finance committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start with a number of thank yous. We've, there's been a lot of hard work and some long hours put into this. I would, first of all, I would like to thank the finance committee, which is the entire town council. I thank you all for your patience and your diligence as we worked through the budget this season. I'd like to thank our town manager, Mr. McGovern, for the many, many hours 
he puts into this and to the municipal staff <laughs> and department heads who do a lot of the preliminary work on the budget. To the school board, their staff and their administration, your realistic approach this year has been very much appreciated. I know you've heard that before, but I want to reinforce that. <laughs> community services director and the staff at community services did a very thorough job in the preparation of their budget for us to review. I want to thank Councillor Creelman. He works on the county budget advisory committee. Although it's only advisory, they seem to be making some progress with the county commissioners to stay within reasonable limits for the county budget. Thank you for your work on that. I know many of the councillors have received communication from citizens about the budget. We thank you for your participation. <coughs> Wish there had been more of you at our neighborhood meeting, but we appreciated the conversation with the citizen who did show up. I also think we owe some thanks to the Cape Courier, especially for their May 2nd issue where they had a summation of what is in the budget being presented this evening. When we set this to workshop, to, you know, to public hearing at last month's meeting, we were looking at some different figures than we're looking at tonight. And I think many of us are pleased with the progress we have made. Just to remind you all that we really started this budget process with a meeting, joint meeting with the school board on January 9th. <coughs> That's when the school board and council started it. Of course, the staff and administrators started quite a few weeks before that. The budget we were initially presented with in March indicated a $1.13 or 6.8% increase over the existing $16.60 rate. What we are proposing this evening is a budget that represents a 52 cent increase or an increase of 3.13 percent. If it is adopted as presented this evening, it would raise the tax rate to $17.12 per thousand. What we've been striving for, as we do with so many of the so much of the work that we do is for the balance. We've looked for the balance between what services are provided and the lev level of delivery of those services, balancing that with the constraints of the economic realities that we're dealing with. I believe that the budget we are presenting is a reflection of the community values and of the town council and school, school board policies. And all of this has been taken with a look at the long-term ramifications of what we're doing. On the municipal side, some of the points I wanted to emphasize are that we will have two, two police patrol cars at each shift. There had been some question about that initially. There will be two patrol cars on each shift. We are still funding a full-time fire chief position. We'll discuss that more later this evening. We are including funding for a ladder truck for the fire department. We are going to fund a townwide revaluation. We are honoring the third year of a contract with our police association. Unfortunately, we are not including a cost of living adjustment for, munis for municipal employees other than the police association. I very sincerely hope that is something that we will not repeat the next year. We did reduce $50,000 from the road work funds. I hope that's something that we don't have to cut as deeply into in the future. One item we had spoken about last fall, I believe, and said we would include in our budget talk was designating money for traffic signals. There is money in the budget that can be designated for traffic signals. It has not been so designated. We agree to continue that discussion and most likely come to a decision next fall. So that was not finally decided on, but there is money to do so if it's desired by the council in the fall. Very fortunately, we are retaining current staff levels. I'm very glad that we can do that. We did have some increases in revenue, the major of that being the increase in the town valuation. And I think with that, Mr. Chairman, if the 
fairly good summation of where we are right now. 52 cent increase. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Councilor McLaughlin. And again, uh, a, a, a hearty uh, thank you goes to you for uh, your tireless efforts with respect to all three of our uh, budgets that you'll be presenting this evening. It was uh, a, a tough year and I think uh, a testimony to a tremendous amount of hard work on your part to uh, keep the, uh, the increase down to a 3.13% uh, uh, level. So uh, a very, very hearty thank you goes to you. At this time, I will open up uh, the public hearing for the general fund budget and would ask uh, uh, if I can have a hand uh, to start signifying who uh, would like to come down to the podium, uh, both state your name and uh, let us know what uh, you have to say about the budget. Who would like to begin? Seeing no hands, I will close this portion of the general fund budget, and I will ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't ready to do that so quickly, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. I would move that it be ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on May 11th, 1992, upon the proposed fiscal year 1993 m municipal budget, does hereby finally adopt the municipal budget for the town of Cape Elizabeth for the fiscal year 1993 with gross expenditures of $14,071,439 and gross resources of $4,141,839 in the amount, the amount of $9,000,000 $929,600 to be raised by taxation. And as further fix Wednesday, October 7th, 1992, and Friday, May 7th, 1993, as the dates upon each which, each of which one half of such taxes due and payable, with interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date at the rate of 10% per annum. We want all these articles too? No, I think we can dispense with uh, Article A through G unless there is any strong feeling on the part of any counselor as to the necessity of reading them with all of the uh, lengthy uh, details to satisfy state statute. <coughs> Hearing no screaming about that, I will we'll dispense with the uh, articles. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Is there discussion? <coughs> All those in favor, please signify with your right hand. Vote is seven to zero for the item number 161, general fund budget, it is thus passed. The next public hearing <coughs> is entitled sewer fund budget, item num number 162, and this is to consider the adoption of the fiscal year 1993 sewer fund budget and take any necessary action. Again, I will defer to Councillor McLaughlin, uh, the chair of the finance committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the sewer fund, we are looking at gross expenditures of $1,359,000 and revenues of $1,362,000. Gives us a slight surplus. We are able to do this and have them so closely balanced because of the recent 15% rate increase. I do want people to understand that even those citizens in town who are not on sewer do make some kind of contribution through their taxes because there is money from the general fund going towards the sewer balance. So even if you're not on sewer, you do have a stake in the sewer budget. Thank you. Thank you again, Councilor McLaughlin. At this time, I will open the sewer fund budget to uh, public comment, uh, asking for a show of any hands who are interested in uh, coming down to the podium to uh, comment upon the sewer fund. Seeing none, I will close this portion of the public, public hearing and ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we order the t that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on May 11th, 1992, does hereby adopt the fiscal year 1993 sewer fund budget with gross expenditures of $1,359,785 and gross revenues of $1,362,000. 362, 
I have a motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the uh, sewer budget draft motion? Seeing none, I will ask uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. The vote is seven to zero. Thank you very much. The third public hearing this evening is entitled Riverside Cemetery Fund Budget, Fiscal Year 1993. It is item 163 on the agenda. And this is to consider the adoption of the Fiscal Year 1993 Riverside Cemetery Fund Budget and take any necessary action. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the Council, I would like to make corrections in the financial amounts in the draft motion that the gross expenditures be $15,551 and the gross revenues be $15,200. Okay, thank you very much. Again, at this time, I would open the Riverside Cemetery Fund budget, fiscal year 1993, uh, for public comment. Is anyone interested in addressing this particular uh, budget, our third of the evening. Seeing no takers, I will close this portion of the uh, public hearing and ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move that it be ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on May 11th, 1992, does hereby adopt the fiscal year 1993 Riverside Cemetery Trust Fund budget with gross, ex gross expenditures of $15,551 and gross revenues of $15,200. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Are there any parts to discuss? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Vote is seven to zero. Thank you very much. Our fourth and final uh, public hearing this evening is entitled Shoreland Zoning <coughs> and Wetland Provision Amendments, as well as a revised zoning map. It is item 164 on the agenda to consider public hearing comments on proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance relating to shoreland zoning and wetlands and to consider the adoption of a revised zoning map and take an, an, any necessary action. Uh, at this time, I will defer to the uh, chair of our ordinance committee, uh, Councillor Cogsell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the <coughs> second time, I believe, that we've set this for public hearing. In order to meet the uh, state mandates for shoreland zoning, which must be in effect by July 1st, we have the planning board and the ordinance committee have spent um, many hours and meetings and considering public input in drafting our shoreland zone amendments. We uh, attempted to change the present wetland ordinance as little as possible to emphasize the work that had been done previously, but we do have some minor revisions in the current wetland ordinance. Um, these were done to um, clarify better timber harvesting um, registration of the pond, and also um, we changed the setback requirements in allowing to have um, tool sheds in a wetland buffer zone within the 100 feet, provided that they are set back from the wetland by 100 feet. Um, and in the buffer to also allow deaths if they meet certain criteria. And that set was at the 75 feet from the wetland edge. We also have decided that um, dunes no longer need to have the 250 foot setback and 100 foot buffer would be sufficient. And we also have reduced um, the minimum size of the wetland from one acre to two acres that was not a the 250 foot buffer. And in some instances, that buffer can be reduced to 100. We have present with us this evening Maureen O'Meara, who is our, our planner, and also our code enforcement officer, uh, Mr. Ernie McVeigh. They're here in their official capacity um, 
but not to respond to any specific instances or individual um, particular circumstances. Those circumstances would be addressed with a formal presentation of an accurate plan um, by both of these parties, also involving um, a site walk and inspection of that particular um, individual's property. We have before us tonight also the a proposed wetland map, which is meant to be a guide, but is far more accurate than any wetland map we had previously. Um, and I think I'll defer to our planner if she wants to make any further additions. You're fine. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Councillor Cogsell. We have received, all of the councillors have received uh, a, a great many uh, pieces of correspondence, uh, both uh, written as well as telephone calls with respect to the uh, shoreland zoning amendments uh, this evening. There have been five particular pieces that have come in since our last council meeting that I should note, however. Uh, the first uh, came in uh, from, Ms. Uh, from Dr. Gramsci. Uh, indicating uh, uh, his unhappiness with a couple of the um, areas of the proposed amendments, uh, primarily uh, the issue of the, um, the fact that the state's recommendation for minimum area of critical wetlands is two or more acres and the town's um, is one acre, and also his disappointment that there is not an allowance uh, for expansion of existing structures which are in the wetlands buffer. Uh, Dr. Gramsci may want to expand upon his thoughts during the public hearing. I also have a correspondence, a fax uh, correspondence that I think Mr. Bianco might want to expand if uh, he cares to when he comes up to the uh, podium during the public hearing. I have a correspondence from Donald uh, Bolduck that I know has spoken personally to Councilor McLaughlin on his concerns, and then I also have a memorandum from uh, our town planner, Maureen O'Mara, with respect to a site walk that um, she was involved with at Nine Pine Point Road. And lastly, I have a correspondence from John Cashwell, uh, uh, director to Maureen O'Mara, uh, with regard to um, some of our draft shoreland zoning uh, amendments. So having noted those particular uh, pieces of correspondence. Uh, at this time, I will open the public hearing uh, to the public uh, and ask for uh, individuals that uh, will want to uh, show me their hand to come down to the uh, podium. And I will call upon Mr. Roberts to uh, come down first. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Town Council. My name is Jack Roberts, and I'm the Chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission. Cape Elizabeth can take pride in the fact that it took an early lead in recognizing and protecting its wetlands. Yet serious degradation did occur prior to the implementation of ordinances, and it still continues. We are faced with dealing equitably with yesterday's mistakes. Homes were bought in areas where we now know they never should have been built. Additional intrusions into the wetlands is not appropriate, and we must accept that. At the same time, however, consider that these owners have a natural barrier protecting them against further development encroaching upon their property, thus adding a real tangible value to the very home they occupy. Do we need to protect wetlands by ordinance, or will simply educating people to their importance be adequate? Consider the fact that a homeowner here in town who has been following the development of this ordinance and who should be sensitive to the problem of, of wetlands has callously violated the Natural Resource Protection Act of the state. This was done by disturbing the topsoil right up to the wetland edge without a permit and without taking any steps to prevent the soil from eroding into the bog. Several councillors are witness to this. Little by little we are destroying our environment, but nobody thinks their little piece of the action will cause any harm. Is, is, is this ordinance perfect? No. But it is a good working document that we can revise and amend when deemed appropriate by the council. A bumper sticker that I saw today says, think globally, act locally. 
it's good advice, and we have that opportunity tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jack. <coughs> Appreciate your comments. Others? Uh, Mr. Bianco, please come right down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, read into the record a um, copy If you just might let everyone know who you are, I know who you are. Uh, my name is Ralph Bianco, and I reside at 9 Pine Point Road in Cape Elizabeth. And um, I would like to read into the record a copy of a letter which is um, now being passed along to the members of the council. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past six months, a great deal of time and effort, and a great deal of, um, of effort has been directed at trying to strike a balance between the needs of the environment and the needs and rights of property owners. Despite this effort, I believe, the, I believe the proposed regulations fall short of addressing the needs and rights of property owners, many of whom remain unclear as to how the shoreland zoning and resource protection regulations affect them. I sincerely appreciate the opportunities that the town has given me to provide input on this important issue. However, I regret to say that the attitude I sometimes encountered among certain councils and town officials were centered more around finding what reasons why something could not be done instead of looking with equal vigor to finding a solution. Before a vote is taken to approve the shoreland zoning ordinance as currently proposed, I think it is very important for all councils to understand that there are significant differences between the state's regulations and the town's regulations. Last Friday, I distributed to the members of the council a copy of a ruling that, by the DEP that allows an expansion which runs parallel to, but does not further encroach on, the wetland. This type of expansion is not permitted by the town. With regard to establishing a resource protection district, the state excludes the following areas, and I'm quoting, except that areas which are currently developed and areas which meet the criteria for limited commercial general development or commercial fisheries slash maritime activities districts need not be within need not be included within the resource protection district in addition the state requires areas of two or more contiguous acres supporting wetland vegetation and hydric soils to be included in the resource protection districts the town regulations require air, such areas to be resource protected if they, are one, if they are one or more acres. It should also be noted that the state regulations provide for an appeals process and the towns do not. Those of us who are affected can live by the state regulations. The most common response I have heard when town officials are asked why the town's regulations are so much more tougher than the state's is, Cape Elizabeth has a long-standing history of preserving its wetlands in excess of the state's requirements. This reasoning is inadequate given the impact that the town's incremental requirements have on many property owners. We ask that the proposed ordinance be amended to include the necessary language that would, one, provide for an appeal appeals process, two, allow expansion with the appropriate controls and approval process parallel to but not toward the wetland, and three, change the minimum size for establishing a resource protection district from one acre to two acres. Perhaps one way for the town to sensibly control the activities that the above proposal would allow is to require that all affected property owners file for a variance. In adopting the current regulations in May of 1990, the town set a precedent by recognizing the unique needs of subdivisions approved by the planning board after 1976. We hope that we, too, may benefit from that same level of understanding. These regulations can be a very bitter pill to swallow, especially since they become effective immediately upon approval without any grace period or other form of adjustment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Bianco. Mr. Chairman, clarification. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you. Statement that these regulations become effective immediately upon approval, is that accurate? No, it's 30 days after uh, they're enacted by the council. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, our town planner, uh, Ms. O'Mara, please. Um, 
on the question of when uh, these regulations become effective, that was a question that was addressed to the town attorney uh, several months ago. I'm not sure he wrote a letter on it, but what he did state to me was that because of the way the state has written the shoreland zoning uh, enactment, that if you adopted shoreland zoning tonight, it would become effective immediately. Which is unusual. Usually, it takes 30 days. It's what? apparently it has something to do with the state enabling legislation. Thank and you. that's assuming that the uh, commissioner of the DEP has nothing to say within 45 days. Um, it, as soon as you adopt it, it would become in a, it would become effective uh, if the commissioner within the 45-day period has comments you would still be functioning under what you adopt tonight. Okay, thank you very much for the clarification. Others who would like to speak to this issue. Uh, Dr. Gramsci, I saw your hand first. <clears throat> My name is Reed Gramsci. I live at uh, 12 Cunner Lane in Cape Elizabeth. I recognize the effort and the hours that the council has put in the wetlands and shoreland zoning. We live here because we love this environment and it must be protected. However, current and proposed zoning uh, ordinances force a severe penalty on existing homeowners. There must be a balance, there must be a way to protect the environment and at the same time allow some changes to be made. For example, my home is 60 years old. There have been many modifications over the years and the new ordinances. I am prohibited from any modifications, expansions to my home. As uh, Ralph Bianco mentioned, the state guidelines and the state recommendations are much more lenient. The town restrictions or the town ordinance are much more restrictive. I think we would all be happy to live with the state guidelines. If the following changes were incorporated into the town ordinances, I think we could live with these and be much happier with them. And these changes are essentially lifted from the uh, state guidelines uh, for uh, municipal recommendations for the wetland, uh, or I'm sorry, for the uh, shoreland zoning proposals. Um, again, and I would mention how severely different and how more restrictive the, the town uh, ordinance and proposed ordinance is than the state ordinance. Number one, the state requires a minimum buffer area or a minimum wetland area of two acres, whereas the town requirement is one acre. This puts a severe um, hardship on any homes located near small ponds or small wetlands. Um, I just wanted to quote uh, one area of the state guidelines regarding non-conformance, uh, non which all of our homes, all of us who find our homes in the wetlands are. It says the purpose and intent of this ordinance is to promote use, land use conformities, except that non-conforming conditions that existed before the effective date of this ordinance shall be allowed to continue subject to the requirements set forth in this section. And it goes on to set forth specific requirements for any change or alteration in a home, an existing home that is in the wetlands. In other words, the state has a specific guidelines that must be followed uh, for any modification of a home in the wetlands. Most of us are in the wetland buffer and under, this, under the town's ordinance, we have no option to change our homes and we have no appeal process. I, fi I feel that there must be a balance between the two. The state, uh, again, has outlined uh, the requirements for modifying and changing homes in the wetlands. And the town is not. I feel the town ordinance is unfair and just not right. And if it were modified to comply with the state, I think that many of us would feel that the environment had been protected, but we had been allowed certain rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gramsci. <coughs> Others, please, come right down. Good evening. My name is Donald Bolduc, and uh, I reside at 78 Old Colony Lane for the past 10 years with my wife and two, two children. I hope uh, this evening that 
in the haste of uh, trying to meet state mandated requirements or before new councilors elect arrive on the scene that uh, the council does not pass or propose amend amendments uh, as submitted to the council without some type of modifications. Again, similar to the comments from the two previous speakers, uh, I do not feel that an appropriate balance has been struck between the rights of existing homeowners and uh, the rights of, of the environment or protecting the environment. Uh, the town's regulations are much more restrictive than the state requirements. And in a letter to each of the town councils, I su suggested a cut three modifications to the proposed amendments. The first would be to provide some sort of grandfathering for existing dwellings to allow for home improvements within a limited space of, say, 15 feet around an, uh, around an existing home. The uh, existing regulations provide some type of grandfathering provisions for other sub subdivisions, even for raw land that's currently undeveloped, yet no such grandfathering provisions exist for existing homeowners. I also suggested that the buffer for decks be reduced to uh, 50 feet from the existing 100 feet rather than the 75 feet as proposed. I think you'll find when you tour some of these neighborhoods, as, as some of the councilors have, most of these neighborhoods or developments were, were site is so close to the water or so close to the, the streams that uh, even reducing it from 100 feet to 75 feet really does not create you know, any additional opportunities for homeowners to expand or add a deck to their existing home. Uh, for example, my lot is probably 25 feet from the street, yet reducing the modification from 100 feet to 75 feet does not give me the ability to add a small 10 or 12 foot deck to the back of my home. Thirdly, uh, as other people have commented on, I, I believe that residents of Cape Elizabeth and homeowners of Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth should have a right to at least appeal uh, and at least have their specific circum circumstances taken into account and evaluated by trained professionals such as the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I hope at least one or hopefully all of these modifications would be adopted uh, before these, these proposed changes are made. The current regulations essentially prevent me from expanding my home or even absent that, even adding a small deck to the back of my house. I have uh, a wife and two children, and uh, we live out of a, a 10 by 10 foot family room adjacent to my kitchen. And my objective is to expand that to uh, give us, you know, adequate facilities for a growing family. And right now, under the current regulations, I'm prevented from doing that, and that's extremely burdensome to uh, to a resident of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Boulder. <coughs> Others who would like to speak to this issue, please. Come right down. <coughs> My name is Tim Eichenberg. I'm on the planning, Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, I'd like to speak in favor of the, uh, of the ordinance as proposed by the Ordinance Committee. Um, I think it strikes a a decent balance between uh, environmental protection and the rights of uh, property owners. It does cut back on the um, restrictions on the wetlands ordinance in a number of ways. It reduces the buffer for sand dunes and wetlands um, it, uh, that are over two acres to 100 feet. Um, it adds a statement that fill land within 100 feet of a principal structure is not a wetland. And uh, it does uh, uh, add a section that reduces the buffer for tool sheds to 100 feet and the buffers for decks to 75 feet. So I think it is making a, a, a gesture and uh, it is you know, lessening the restrictions on the wetlands ordinances. What I'm concerned about in this process is that in 1990 the uh, town council uh, had a number of hearings and a number of um, uh, very um, uh, critical studies were conducted with respect to the wetlands ordinance. And the wetlands ordinance was enacted after uh, period of uh, what I understand was a reasoned discussion. In this particular case, you're looking at the shoreland zoning uh, provisions, and you're unwinding what you did in 1990, uh, not considering the same evidence that you had before you uh, in 1990. You're considering the shoreland zoning provisions. 
uh, I don't think that you've had before you today or during this discussion the same evidence with respect to the sensitivity of the critical wetlands, which is what we're talking about here, not just the wetland protection zones, but the, act the most critical wetlands um, that you had before you in 1990. And I don't think this process uh, is, is, has before it the same degree of evidence with respect to the sensitivity of these critical wetlands that you had in 1990. And I don't think that this is really the time to start chipping away at the wetlands protection ordinance uh, that you adopted after such a reasoned discussion and after such a long period of deliberation in 1990. So I would urge you to accept the ordinance committee's recommendations and not unwind what you did in 1990 to, the, to a greater extent than it's already been done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eichenberg. <coughs> Others? Uh, Dr. Rand. Thank you. I'm uh, Pete Rand from 1222 Shaw Road, uh, president of the Land Trust, but not representing them, representing myself tonight and someone who's been involved in this uh, issue that you're discussing now for about 20 years. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to persuade you to adopt the amendment package that you have before you for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that they'll provide protection that the Cape Elizabeth wetlands badly need. And second, that they will allow some experience to be gained from which to develop subsequent amendments if needed to address any real faults or unfairnesses that are in them. The Cape's wetlands do need protection. More than half the town is a wetland, maybe 60 odd percent. A major part of the ecology that represents the rural character of the town is in its wetlands. Those wetlands have already suffered significant abuse from activities that the ordinance will protect against. Those include filling, draining, excavating, and polluting. Filling, for example. We've seen the effects of filling perhaps up across the road from cottage farms, if you're all familiar with the problem there. In Eastfield, in Broad Cove. Draining. There used to be an awfully good pond behind Viking Nursing Home in Willowbrook. It's not there because it's drained. Excavating. Go look behind the Jordan Farm on Two Lights Road and see what excavating did to a vast wetland there. Uh, that made essentially a bunch of tank traps out of it. <coughs> Polluting. We used to have a uh, water quality testing program in the state that went on for about a dozen years. And from that, at least back then, we can say that Trout Brook, for example, has got quite a bit of material coming in it that increases fecal coliform counts, increases nitrates, and increases phosphorus. All examples of, uh, of uh, septic pollution, perhaps. Pond Cove uh, Brook uh, in the south had, uh, some, has some phosphorus pollution in it that was subsequently traced to a, to a uh, septic tank, but there may be more there. We, we don't know. Alewife Brook has had some serious problems at the bottom of it, at the base of it. Uh, Crescent Beach, uh, the wetland behind Crescent Beach has some high nitrogen in it that uh, comes from down from the hill above. And Great Pond, which is one of the uh, town's major wetland assets, uh, has uh, in the, has some uh, uh, high uh, ish nitrogen uh, and phosphorus counts in the northwest corner of it, perhaps coming from the development that is on the uh, off the shell, uh, Fowler Road. These data come from anywhere 10 years back, and we don't know what the situation is right now. And people, or at least uh, their pocketbooks, have suffered from the inter from uh, inappropriate building in wetlands or within wetland buffers. We're reminded of boulders that have appeared in people's bed, uh, living rooms after severe winter storms in the last couple of years. Flooding, for, for example, in Delano Park, whenever the swamp above it floods, the homes down there uh, find that uh, uh, they uh, have quite a bit of water around them. Unstable construction. Uh, there are a couple of houses that are built uh, close to an area that's uh, uh, been of concern in the process of this uh, particular issue that uh, were built about 10 years ago that uh, uh, essentially sank into the wetlands and uh, had some severe uh, problems with them. And uh, I'm also reminded of a high school we had that uh, was <coughs> built uh, perhaps in an area that was a little bit too damp and it had some severe settling problems that we as taxpayers had to pay for maybe 10, 15 years ago. 
One of our problems, though, is not knowing what other damage may have occurred or is occurring on our wetlands because we have no good measurements of groundwater pollution in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we, we have, for example, no measurements that I know of of uh, uh, gasoline, hydrocarbons, or other organic pollutions, and we have no knowledge, in fact, of where our aquifers are. And there are people in Cape Elizabeth who depend on drilled wells for their water supply. Probably the most serious problem, though, is the proximity of dense development right next to major wetlands, which magnifies the cumulative impact of a lot of little pollutions which are flushed more rapidly into wetlands by runoff that's increased by the impervious roofs and the driveways of those dense developments. So from all of this, in my view, we've needed this ordinance and its proposed amendments for at least the last 30 years, and I strongly recommend their adoption now. Some of the basic restrictions contained in the ordinance should be absolute and not subject to appeal. For example, houses should no more be built in critical wetlands and video stores should be allowed in residential zones. It may be, however, that after some experience with this ordinance, the need to provide some sort of appeal process for some restricted activities may become apparent. It's important for all parties to recognize that the stone into which Cape Elizabeth wetland ordinance have been carved is very much a rolling one. By my count, this is the sixth change that has been considered since 1976, during which time we've only had two comprehensive plans. If, however, under some very well-defined circumstances, variances are to be granted by future amendments, I would right like to recommend to the Ordinance Committee and to the Town Council that they consider ways in which the Cape's wetlands will benefit by each variance. For example, by a contribution from the applicant landowner to a wetlands preservation fund. Money from this fund could be used to support the continuing water quality monitoring program we need to understand our wetlands better, or even to improve or replace some of the wetlands that are so vital to the Capes and our own well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rand. <coughs> Others? Please come right down. <laughs> Perhaps if you just wait a moment. Uh. Go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Jean Attix. I'm a homeowner on 1257 Sawyer Road. Um, I'd like to just reiterate a little bit of Mr. Bianco, Mr. Bolduck's, and Mr. Gramsci's concern. I, too, have an existing dwelling. I find that the state guidelines seem quite adequate. My concern is the lack of an appeal process. I find our diminishing their state guideline of two acres to one acre to be too confining. Thank you very much. Others, please. I see a hand. Good evening, Jerry Anger, 69 Brentwood Road. I have heard a number of issues raised tonight, and I think one of the important things that I would challenge the council members that are, stand, are sitting in front of me is to think this through very carefully, because there's one word I think that's very important that maybe not my particular home, but other particular homes are involved with. You folks have done a magnificent job in trying times to keep our budget under control and a three point I think you said Janet 3.13 percent rise and I think that's magnificent but as Dr. Gramsci pointed out earlier and I was home watching this on television fortunately I live close enough so I'm here uh, the appeals process can any one of us watching on television can any one of us sitting in this room tonight have the ability to do something to our home or are we putting ourselves in a lockdown that is going to take a lot of legal counsel and all community wrangling to resolve or change. And I would challenge you folks, the seven of you, that are going to have the opportunity to benefit our entire community of 8,000 plus folks to weigh very carefully what we are doing. I don't think that we necessarily as a community have to make, as Mr. Rand said, a decision tonight unless we really have all the facts in front of us. 
I know I, as an American and citizen of Cape Elizabeth, would certainly, if anybody came and did me wrong, would want to have an appeals process. And not having that available to us, I find that very, very disturbing. And I know that the seven of you that are taking the time and the effort to do the budget job will also take the time and the effort to do a good job so that this is a fair ordinance for all of us that we can live with in the community. Not only Jack Roberts, who started off the discussion this evening, and others that followed him suggesting one side of the coin, but also the others that maybe are suggesting a little bit of restraint. Let's review the state guidelines. There are 8,000 people in this community. Let's not necessarily lock us all up. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Anchair. Others, please. Uh, Mr. Edsel, come on right down. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, council members, staff. Uh, my name is Steve Edsel, planning board member. Um, when I saw all those people stand up, I thought they were all in front of me to speak. But, uh, I guess they were just leaving. Um, first of all, I, I think I'd like to say that, that uh, as the chairman of the plan planning board, when this, this came through, uh, the planning board um, portion of, of the ordinance creation. Um, I'm extremely encouraged by the amount of public input. Uh, I think all of us who are involved in, in municipal government uh, uh, would like to see this much input at the beginning of a process. Uh, and I'm not finding fault with that at all. I'm just simply saying that that uh, is, is common uh, or has been a common problem in, in uh, deriving many of these these ordinances. Um, I am here tonight to um, urge the, the council uh, with, with cautious support uh, of the ordinance as it exists in front of you. Um, and, and I hope you've had a, a real strong listening ear as you've heard the comments. And I, I'd just like to mention uh, a couple things. Um, that passed through my mind as I sat uh, and listened to these comments. Number one, I think there should be no question um, as to um, the roots or the, the origin uh, or the mandate of, of our wetlands ordinance and the, and the shoreland zoning uh, ordinance provisions. Um, I, I think the, the strength of what has, has, is now before you um, comes most directly from our comprehensive plan, which makes it very clear, and, and it states, I didn't bring it uh, up with me, but uh, in the introduction, where it's the most brief and, and, and most concise, um, it says, these assets and characteristics will not be compromised. And it lists wetlands and shoreland. Um, it does not say that, that as we draw up these ordinances, we won't compromise as we're, as we're developing them. It just simply says, these assets and characteristics will not be compromised. And I think that's very strong. Then in, in the policies uh, and recommendations, it, it's, it's quite specific as to what the wishes of this town, and it deals with the character of this town. Uh, the wetlands are, are probably a more prominent asset and characteristic of this town than almost, or, or the majority of towns in, in the state of Maine. I think there are two major concerns, and, and I, in, in hearing the comments, I, I think they, they stem from two major things. Number one, um, that there is a, a more popular, and it's sort of driven by the media a little bit, but there's a very popular swing uh, saying that, that wetlands and, and certain other environmental issues, the pendulum has swung too far. Uh, and I guess, um, as a person who sits in, in, a, in a judgment making or judgment uh, making role as a planning board member, uh, dealing with the regulations uh, and the ordinances of, of this town, I try to look at the issues um, in, in a fair and equitable manner. Um, how we deal with each individual uh, site uh, and the entirety of any site that, that we're looking at. I think the, the second issue is, is that 
when people read through this ordinance um, and we get to the critical wetlands area, which seems to be the, the, the key uh, concentration of what most people uh, are, are talking or, or, or making comments about, is the appearance of, of, of uh, what you get is not always what you see. And it, and it deals mostly um, with the, the characteristics of how you define uh, critical wetlands. Um, and, and I think there's a real question of credibility. When I personally visit a lot of these sites, and I visited sites in the last three or four days here uh, in the town, I, I took specific sites to, to, uh, to visit, and, and I personally and I have for the last three years uh, of being on the planning board. Um, there's a question that comes into my mind when a, a site has one or more characteristics, one or more of the six characteristics that define a critical wetlands, um, becomes a wetland, and as the general public looks at that piece of land and they go to the land or the land is several feet from their home or not so many several feet from their home and says it's not wet, it doesn't look wet, why am I dealing with wetlands? Um, I'm not saying that they're, they're these, these criteria are correct. I'm not saying they're incorrect, uh, whether they're appropriate or not. I, I just think there is a credibility problem, w which I see as a planning board member uh, dealing with critical wetlands. Um, I, I encourage this board because I do feel that the criteria for uh, critical wetlands that we've set before you are correct, and they are in the best interest of our wetlands. I think what I, one thing that I hear tonight is, is that the appeals process, if it can be improved in this ordinance, uh, is an area uh, where we, we can stand some improvement. Um, and I'm not sure what the answers are. Uh, I just see that this is an issue that is, is very troubled. Uh, it has been with us for some time since uh, draft number 16 or 17 or 18, whatever, of the wetlands. Uh, um, and I remember Chairman Creelman was uh, going through 16A and 16B. It's been a lot of years since we we've, we've first brought this up. I think it, it, it's, it's time to take a long, hard look at it. Uh, again, um, I'm in, in full support of this, and, and I wouldn't be standing here tonight if I was not. But I, I, I urge um, the council to take um, a cautious look and a, and a listening look. Listen to what the public says. Uh, I have real concerns, and I'm certainly not uh, capable or informed enough to, to, to uh, uh, talk about the legal issues uh, of homeowners or single sites. Uh, as it affects um, or value-related um, issues, legal issues. Um, I will say that the, of, of the legal cases that I've read in, in the last year and a half, they most have not been favorable to individual home owners. Um, I, I think that's where the listening ear of the council, the listening ear of the, the, uh, the, the planning board has to be wide open. Um, again, I'm, I'm here. Uh, with, with cautious uh, but supporting uh, this ordinance as it is before you, uh, with, those, with those reminders in place that we listen. This is an ongoing process. It's, it's one of the key issues that we all deal with uh, and we'll deal with for the next few years, number, number of years. Um, and I urge, I urge complete support of, of this ordinance uh, with a long-term uh, commitment to listening and uh, keeping the characteristics and assets of this town according to our uh, comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Edsel. <coughs> Others that would uh, care to speak? Okay, seeing no... Okay, go right ahead. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Council. My name is Peter Anderson. I reside at uh, Forest Road. Um, one thing that strikes me, uh, I came here thinking of speaking in different uh, circumstances of different things, but it seems to me that no matter how finely crafted an ordinance uh, is before the board, it will not accommodate everyone. There is going to be an exception to it. And to come here, and actually I wasn't aware of this, to learn that there is no appeals process seems to me takes out the idea of having responsive government. 
all of us as property owners feel that we have a right within our community to address our governing bodies and um, bring to their attention uh, anything that we might consider unfair. And to not be able to address those concerns, I think, would leave a lot of people feeling that uh, perhaps abandonment is a bit too, uh, too uh, excessive, but uh, to feel that the government isn't responding to their needs. I have uh, very specific concerns regarding this ordinance in my property, but I, I find myself at this meeting feeling that uh, it's, it's well, much broader than myself, but in terms of just uh, living in the community and how it addresses concerns of everyone here. Uh, there's going to be an exception to this ordinance, and to not allow an appeal, but to perhaps consider that an unfairness will be addressed later through further legislation, uh, I don't understand how that is... Uh, representative of uh, the government that I was taught in, you know, American civilization is the, uh, please excuse me, I'm not the best public speaker, but I'm trying my best here. Um, I just feel that no matter how, how much work went into this ordinance, I know there was a great deal of it. Uh, there's going to be someone who's going to be left out by it, and that person has no recourse if you approve this in, in the way it is before you at this time. <coughs> you can alter setbacks as you will, but at least allow an appeal for someone who is, is not going to be accommodated under this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. <coughs> Others who uh, would like to speak to this issue? thinking about maybe wanting to speak on this issue. I want to give everyone a chance. Anyone at home who <laughs> wants to drive down. Okay, seeing no further hands, I will close the public hearing uh, at this particular time. What I think might be the easiest thing to do if, is that if we could have a motion in a second and then have a, a lengthy discussion on the topic, uh, are you willing to make a motion, uh, Councillor Cogsell? Yes, I am. I move that we approve the zoning ordinance relating to shoreland zoning and the wetlands and to adopt the revised zoning act as presented this evening. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, can I hear a second? Second. Okay, there is a motion and a second. Uh, uh, let us have a discussion at this particular time. Uh, my thought, uh, Ms. O'Mara, if you might come to the podium, certainly the, the comments that have been uh, uh, spoken to this evening by our uh, nine individuals who have come up to the podium seem to boil down to about four areas, uh, in all honesty, uh, which on the one hand, uh, I suppose, makes the uh, Ordinance Committee feel good that there are only four problems and not 400. Um, but there do seem to be about four areas um, that I would like to at least get your input on. And I recognize I'm putting you in an awkward position because you're not a policymaker. You're here for, for technical issues. We are the policymakers, and uh, we'll stand by our vote. Um, but there is an issue, uh, a technical issue, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to uh, Mr. Bolduck's uh, reducing the buffer uh, decks proposal. Uh, to 25 feet that I would like you to speak on. Um, I would also uh, like you to speak on, if you're comfortable, um, a grandfathering story as well as the, uh, the right to appeal, but I know Councillor Cogsall will certainly uh, discuss that right to appeal since page 34 is clear in the ordinance uh, about that particular issue. Um, the one foot, excuse me, the one acre, two acre issue I'd like you to respond to, uh, please. And the parallel, uh, but not toward wetland issue, I would like you to speak to, please. Uh, the rest of the issues, I think, are, po are strictly policy. Uh, starting with the, the request, I believe, Mr. Bolden 
requested that the setback for decks be 50 feet as opposed to the 75 feet that's currently proposed. Um, I don't believe that the 50 foot setback complies with the, the minimum standards that are required by the state. Uh, under the state shoreland zoning, there has to be a minimum setback of 75 feet. I would have to, uh, I'm almost certain that the area that Mr. Bolduc is talking about is covered by state shoreland zoning. Uh, the state shoreland zoning doesn't cover all wetlands. Outside of the shoreland zone, it only covers wetlands that are 10 acres or greater in size. I believe that particular wetland is included in the shoreland zone. So uh, there's, a seven, there's a shoreland zone around that area, and the minimum standard is a 75-foot setback. So if the council um, wished to reduce that setback to 50 feet, uh, there would also have to be an argument made that was uh, related to the special local considerations of the town. Um, I'll just continue on with, with the grandfathering issue. There was a request that uh, existing structures be grandfathered from the existing requirements. I think that's a three-part issue. Um, in terms of the legal aspects, there has been uh, some comment from our town attorney in which he feels that on one hand, there is a precedent in the ordinance and in terms of, of zoning by towns, to grandfather existing uses. On the other hand, um, there is an argument under the Equal Protection Clause that if you res you have to have a reasonable great relationship between res allowing certain individuals to have an activity while prohibiting other activity uh, other individuals from an activity. In this case, uh, if you were to allow grandfathering, you would be allowing existing structures to expand and therefore probably negatively impact a natural resource area without any relationship to how much they were impacting that natural resource. On the other hand, those people that own property where they have not built structures and may want to build a structure that would have less impact are not allowed to build because they wouldn't be considered grandfathered. I also believe there was a discussion about the existing grandfathering clause in the ordinance regarding to subdivisions that were approved after 1976. Um, it is my understanding that uh, the ordinance does have a provision that says if you ha are, have a lot in a subdivision that was approved after 1976, uh, you may build on that, that lot even if it in, uh, intrudes onto a wetland protection, uh, excuse me, a critical wetland buffer. Um, up until the year 2000. After the year 2000, you have to meet all the requirements that we currently have. Uh, it's my understanding that the council uh, chose that date because all subdivisions approved after 1976 received some kind of wetlands alteration permit from the town because after 1976, the town had wetlands alteration regulations. Subdivisions approved before that date did not receive a wetlands alteration review. I think if you review some of the subdivisions that were approved after 1976, you'll find that as part of the subdivision review, there were buffer and setback requirements that were imposed on lots and on the entire subdivision to somehow protect wetland areas. So I, I believe that was the rationale for that grandfathering. Um, going to the third issue, the, the right to appeal. Um, the current ordinance, the ordinance as proposed, states that uh, residential structures and accessory structures are not permitted in the critical wetland zone. And that's a current standard in the ordinance. It's also required under the state shoreland zoning. Um, in addition, when the town adopted the wetlands regulations in 1990, there was a policy, as I, get, as I understand, there was a poli policy decision at that time to not distinguish between the uses that were going to be prohibited in the critical wetland zone and the uses that were going to be prohibited in the critical wetland buffer. In other words, if it's not allowed in the wetland, it's not allowed in the buffer. So for that reason, those uses are not permitted. It's, it's e exactly identical to zoning an area for residential use and then not, not uh, permitting business uses or not permitting industrial uses. For that reason, there is no appeals process. Just as someone would not be able to come to the town and uh, request uh, an appeal so that they could construct an office building or uh, 
an industrial building in a residential zone, they cannot come to the town and appeal to construct a residential building in a critical wetland or resource protection zone. So that's why there is no appeals process under, under our wetlands regulations. I will point out that under shoreland zoning, shoreland zoning under the state, uh, if you're a non-conforming structure, you are allowed to come to, this, to come to the local appeals board and make an appeal for variance. But uh, if I can quote Dan Pritchard, who was at the site walk last Thursday, um, it was his experience in working with shoreland zoning that it was extremely difficult for anyone to ever get a successful variance appeal if they already had an existing structure on their lot because they couldn't meet the standard that said they had no economic return or no economic value on their property. But that, that, that is the reason why there, there is no appeal under this particular situation. Uh, under the, the issue of the one acre and the two acre, again, uh, the town decided in 1990 that wetlands that were an acre in size were critical enough and important enough to protect. Again, in speaking with Dan Pritchard last Thursday, he, he, was, he was directly asked, why did the state pick two acres as its standard? His response was, because we can't map things smaller than two acres in size and we didn't think it was fair to ask the towns to protect something that was less than two acres if we can't even find it on a map. Um, I think the town has addressed that issue in its, its structure of the ordinance and in its map in that all the resource protection zones have to be field verified. So that even if you're less than two acres in size and we can't find you on our aerial soils map, uh, we still have a very specific definition in the ordinance so that someone can go out to the field and define the area of the wetland. Um, finally, the last question uh, that I remember was on expansion of structures in the shoreland zone. Um, in the shoreland zoning ordinance that's proposed before you tonight, if you're a non-conforming structure, and typically non-conforming will mean that you're within 75 feet of the, of 75 feet of the, up, of the upland edge or of the uh, high water line, you're considered non-conforming because the minimum setback is 75 feet. If a portion of your structure is within the 75 feet, you may be able to expand that portion of the structure up to 30% of the volume of the structure, as long as you don't get any closer to the protected resource. Um, that means that you may be able to, ex if you have, for example, uh, a house that faces on the ocean um, and you want to add a deck and your house is already too close, you can't add a deck off the back of your house you may be able to add a deck off the side of your house because it doesn't extend any closer to the water's edge than your house already does. And that's what's allowed right now. Under, uh, and again, that applies to wetlands. Again, under our local wetlands regulations, if you're within 100 feet of a critical wetland edge, you're in the, wet, you're in the wetland buffer. And expansion of residential structures is not a permitted use, so you would not be allowed to do it. Are there any questions I can answer at this time? Please, uh, Councilor Coxon. Maureen, um, didn't we address the one acre issue and expand it to two acres? Uh, what was proposed in here is that if you have a critical wetland that is two acres or less in size, uh, the buffer was reduced from 250 feet to 100 feet. Uh, currently, in the ordinance we have before you, all critical wetland zones have a 250-foot buffer around them, and then you may apply for a reduction in the width of that buffer if you meet certain criteria. And a new criteria that's being proposed is the size of the wetland. If you have a critical wetland that's two acres or less in size, you can apply and have that buffer reduced down to 100 feet. Councilman McLaughlin. Mr. Mayor, we've heard a number of residents speak tonight about their desire for us to adopt the state guidelines rather than what has been proposed through the Ordinance Committee. Can you give a nutshell of what the ramifications would be on our, our existing ordinances if that were to be the case? Nutshell, huh? Um, I, I, I believe, as I've stated before, uh, the shoreland zoning amendments that are when let's go back to the beginning when the planning board started looking at the whole shoreland zoning amendments they looked at two different options one was to adopt the shoreland zoning ordinance as proposed by the state in mass 
um, and just change, you know, fill in the name town of Cape Elizabeth in the appropriate blanks. The other option was to take our existing ordinances and modify them as little as possible to bring them into compliance with the state requirements. Um, if we were just to adopt the state minimum standards, I believe there are several places where the town has had more restrictive standards for years uh, that we would, we would lose. Uh, in addition, I believe that there are places in the ordinance right now that are less restrictive than the state. And if we were to adopt those, uh, again, I think it would compromise the ordinance that you have right now, which is specifically tailored to the special circumstances of the town. Um, an example of that is the division of wetlands into two zones, the critical wetland zone, which has been discussed a lot tonight, and the wetland protection zone, which has not been discussed tonight. Uh, the state doesn't recognize two wetland zones. Uh, they say if you have an area of 10 acres or more of hydric soils outside the shoreland zone, then it has to be in resource protection and it has to meet very stringent uh, development standards. Uh, what the town of Cape Elizabeth has done is said, okay, if it's very wet, it's in the critical wetland zone and you can't build in it. But if it's wet but not very wet, if it's a poorly drained soil, then you can build in it. So I think one example of that would be um, if you looked at any of our wetland protection zones that are 10 acres or more in size, we currently allow people to construct in those areas with a special permit from the planning board. I'm not sure that we would allow, be allowed to do that if we just adopted the state shoreland zoning in mass. Uh, another example is the, uh, and the other side is the normal high watermark definition. Uh, if you look at tidal waters, the town of Cape Elizabeth, uh, as I understand for years, has defined the normal high watermark as the top of the bank. And the argument has been that because of the specific storm, storm surge that's experienced in this town, that's the standard that needs to be used. However, the state has a less restrictive standard. They say where the land beats the water. So uh, those are just those are two examples. Uh, I, I could go on. The one acre, two acre definition is, is another distinction. Um, but again, I think what, what the town would propose to the state, and we do have to submit this to the state for approval, is that uh, I think we'd argue that as a document, as a package, it meets the intent of the state requirements and is tailored to the, the special local circumstances of this town. Thank you. That answers your question. Yeah. Councilor Cox. And just to add to what Maureen said about the top of the bank definition, um, we had we had a major lawsuit and the town won because we could document our definition. So even though it is stricter than what the state says, we have um, Further uh, questions uh, for our town planner or our chair of the ordinance committee? We had um, new information that Maureen um, rode away for from other states and from the Army Corps of Engineers. We have um, had serious discussions of buffers and the importance of buffers on wetlands, critical wetlands. And we had a special public information meeting um, about buffers. And Maureen presented that material and has continually made this material available to people wanting to come. So I can't say that um, we haven't reviewed what the information we had before, but in addition, more current documented information about the importance of offers. Um, we also reviewed the basic policies that we set forth before, um, a prohibition of filling wetlands, limited filling of less sensitive and protect protection of wetlands, minimum buffers, that are necessary for critical wetlands, and we do not require buffering for wetland protection areas, only critical wetland areas. And we have carried on that discussion for some time with an exchange between concerned citizens, 
people involved in the conservation, um, other landowners, trained foresters, and so it went back and forth, and that's how we came up with some of the changes we have before we Thank you very much, uh, Phyllis. Other input on the uh, issue of these amendments? Councilor Jordan. I don't know if I can add too much to what has already been said, but my concerns are, and it has been very long, and I know we <coughs> explored, I think, most all avenues, if not all avenues, as far as the wetlands and the protections of wetlands. I'm not one to, uh, <coughs> to fill in wetlands and do some of the things that has been done in the past. But my only concern is the people that have purchased a place on the edge of these wetland areas, that there isn't some way that they can't make their home more compatible to what they're living and be able to have an appeal process or an appeal to a body in order to, to do it. I don't think that uh, if it's been filling around it in the past, why it would be so damaging for them to uh, add their uh, little room and what have you. And I think that uh, <coughs> Some of the restrictions that the Cape has is, to me, is uh, going a little is going a little too much, and I feel that uh, they should be able to have an exception of something that was done 20 years ago, we'll say, and they purchased the place, and now in order for them to, if the family increases, they got to sell and buy somewhere else in order to have. Acceptable rooms for their family, and if they can do something without filling in more, I think there ought to be a way that this could be done. Thank you, uh, Councilor Jordan. <clears throat> I'd just like to read the preface. Uh, two short paragraphs to the. Uh, State of Maine guidelines for municipal shoreland zoning ordinances that uh, became effective March 24, 1990. The Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act 38 MRSA sections 435 to 449 requires all municipalities to adopt, administer, and enforce ordinances which regulate land use activities within 250 feet of great ponds, rivers, freshwater and coastal wetlands, and tidal waters and within 75 feet of streams as defined. The Act also requires the Board of Environmental Protection to establish minimum guidelines for such ordinances. This document adopted by the Board on February 14, 1990 contains those minimum guidelines for municipal shoreland ordinances. The Act requires that municipalities adopt shoreland zoning ordinances consistent with or no less stringent than those minimum guidelines. Municipalities need not adopt this guideline ordinance word for word. In fact, the department encourages municipalities to consider local planning documents and other special local considerations and to modify this ordinance into one that meets the needs of the particular community. Municipalities may wish to adopt more stringent ordinances or ordinances which are completely different from the guidelines provided that such ordinances are equally or more effective in achieving uh, the purposes of the Act. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Emerald. Yeah, uh, I'd like to follow up on Councilor Jordan's comments. I too would like to find a way so that individual homeowners could uh, make adjustments to their homes as their family needs change. However, it's, uh, it's really difficult to balance those individual needs with what the cumulative effect of several people doing that in a neighborhood would be on uh, the environment. Uh, so I feel that uh, the 
advice that we received from our uh, Conservation Commission, uh, President Jack Roberts, from uh, Dr. Rand, who uh, has years and years of experience in this area, plus our planning board, uh, which has also dealt for many years with, this, uh, with these factors, that the, all of that expertise, uh, I feel, weighs heavily on what my decision will be tonight. And that as much as I would like to see us be as flexible as possible, uh, I think that the, uh, 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 the case has been made that we need to uh, uh, adopt an ordinance of this type in order to protect this community over, over the long haul. Uh, but it's been mentioned by several people also tonight that no ordinance is going to uh, be written in stone and that we have to look at the experience over time and make adjustments as need be. Uh, so uh, having said all of that, uh, I plan to vote in favor of this ordinance tonight. And, and no, knowing that the council uh, will bring before it, as needed, uh, recommended changes based on the experience uh, that they have over the years. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, make a comment before a vote? Uh, Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to remind the council that when this item was sent to the Ordinance Committee at our January meeting, we were given four directives in Councillor Amro's motion and Councillor Jordan's second that evening. One was to look at coastal sand dunes. I think you're aware of the revision we've made regarding the buffer around sand dunes. Another was looking at additions to existing properties was what we had too restrictive. We addressed that regarding tool sheds and decks question, should wetlands that have been filled be treated differently? We have changed the terminology and therefore alleviated the restriction for some homeowners by moving the line of the edge of the wetland. We were also asked, it was also stated that we would ask residents pr to prepare specific proposals for ordinance amendments. We did have residents do that. I know we have some very dissatisfied and disgruntled residents because there was not agreement with the specific proposals that they were putting forth. I appreciate that, and I've said to a number of you, we get to a point sometimes where reasonable people disagree. We continue to receive proposals from the citizens. I am honestly very appreciative of that. The one new thing, at least one new thing I heard tonight, I know I did hear one new thing tonight, was in Peter Rand's presentation when talking about the appeals process and when I was sitting with Mr. Bolduc yesterday talking about this, I said, you know, we've got to find a way to let's keep looking at an appeals process. What Dr. Rand mentioned was to set up a wetlands preservation fund. That's something that I think we need to take under consideration. I'm not prepared to put that as an amendment to the ordinance tonight because we do things deliberately. We take longer than a lot of people ever want us to take on these things. That's part of the process. It's very frustrating sometimes. I have been on the frustrating end of a lot of process. I can readily identify with that. But we are looking at an ordinance that covers the entire community. And I think we do have to keep that in mind. I do feel that the Ordinance Committee did attend to the requests of the council from January. I will be supporting what is before the council tonight. Some people said, you being really consistent, Janet? Two years ago, you voted against the wetlands ordinance. Yes, I did. I was very concerned at that time about the balance of the protection restrictions and property rights. I do think that we have made considerable progress. I'm not saying we're done. I do want you to know that I sincerely am not saying we are necessarily done. There are more things we need to look at. I do feel we are at a point now where I can support what is before us and will be doing so this evening. Thank you. Councilor Cox. I would like to um, recommend that instead of having the shoreland zoning ordinance become effective immediately, that we use our usual process of 30 days. 
because in 30 days it would give us a chance to really have a clean copy of the ordinance without, as we have here, things crossed out in brackets for the changes. And also it would give us time to train our planning board, our zoning board, and, um, and edu finish complete the education of various um, town staff as far as the interpretation of the ordinance. Does anyone have any problem with the 30-day uh, issue? Are there any other comments or, or uh, Council Ramrell? Yeah, I just want to add uh, my personal appreciation to the audience committee who did go back and did review uh, <laughs> over and over again several recommendations that came from this council as a result of public hearings. And, and I think you have been very accommodating to uh, to issues raised by the public and to uh, uh, the suggestions of the council as a whole. I really appreciate uh, all of that work uh, that you did put in uh, and, the, uh, and the time you took to hear all of the input necessary to make the, the recommendations that you did. Mr. Chairman? Councilor Chapel. I've also got to commend the Ordinance Committee. I went to their last three meetings and I want you to know they've gone through a tremendous amount of paperwork. What we get in our files is very little compared to what they have done since January. I think it's a great job. I am in favor of the ordinance except for one thing. I can't vote for it without an appeals process. I don't care whether an appeals process is not possible or whether it's going to uh, uh, be impossible for somebody to appeal and get anywhere. All my life, I've believed that if you think you're being trod on, that you have a right to stand up and appeal, not told by some group that you can't. So I, that's the only fault that I have with it tonight. I think the Ordinance Committee has bent over backwards for the citizens of the community. They put uh, several uh, things in there that weren't in before, and I, I am very pleased with it. I think we can live with it. With uh, uh, modifications in the future as they become necessary and all working together. I don't think anybody's going to get hurt too bad. Somebody always gets hurt when you pass an ordinance. Always. But give us an appeal process and I'll vote for it. Uh, comments. Uh, Councilor Pearson. Yes, Councilor Perelman, uh, Chairman Perelman. Uh I concur with uh, Councilor Chapel. Uh, and sort of throw in with conjunction uh, what, what Councillor McLaughlin said relative to what Dr. Ann mentioned about the wetlands fund uh, or some type of avenue thereof. Um, just in the appeals process, I, I wish that there was some uh, area in there that addressed alternative construction methodology. Uh, I, I think there are alternatives available. I think there's been a lot of situations where uh, in lieu of wetlands, uh, filling that more wetlands are created. Uh, once again, I commend the, the uh, Ordinance Committee because I sat through quite a few of the meetings too. And uh, but I, I, I need to have some kind of appeals uh, process before I can vote for it. That's kind of Thank you. Thank you. Other, other comments on the right side? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, I would ask the town <coughs> clerk, please, to uh, call a roll call vote on this particular issue. Councilor Amaral? Yes. Councilor Coxwell? Yes. Councilor Chapel? No. Councilor Jordan? No. Councilor McLaughlin? Yes. Councilor Pearson? No. And Chairman Curry? Yes. The motion carries four to three. And I will uh, take a five minute recess at this particular time. David, don't go away. I've got some more. I want to say that we're waiting instead of skipping out early.
from the town manager on a needs assessment for the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department and take any necessary action, and I will defer to the town manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the last several months since the untimely passing of Chief Webster, uh, I've been undertaking a needs assessment of the fire department, particularly in relation to uh, the fire chief's position. Uh, there had been some discussion over the last couple of years on whether or not it ought to be a full-time or a part-time position. Uh, the needs assessment at this point, uh, I think primarily if you read my memo, I think more than anything it, it reflected an awful lot of reflection on my part. It's an issue I don't know, know of that I've spent more time thinking about uh, over the last several years than this particular one, particularly because I seem to be heading in a direction that was contrary to a recommendation I made a year ago. Uh, the, in addition to a lot of reflection, I also tried to meet with as many people as possible. Uh, all of the members of uh, the volunteer companies of Engine 1, 2, and the rescue were invited to make an appointment or just drop in to see me at, at any given point. Uh, over a dozen of the volunteers uh, did come in and, and talk to me uh, at different times. I also had two meetings with the Board of Engineers of the Department. The Board of Engineers consists of the uh, acting fire chief, uh, the deputy fire chief, as well as the elected officers of the three companies, the captains and lieutenants of the, the two fire companies and the rescue company. Also uh, had consultations with former Cape Elizabeth chiefs, uh, present area chiefs uh, from the greater Portland area, uh, fellow managers, as well as with some volunteers in other departments. Uh, basically, in, throughout the whole process, I kept asking myself uh, two questions. First, would fire services suffer if we returned to a part-time chief? And secondly, if we continued with a full-time chief, would we receive sufficient value from the position? Uh, I've concluded that, you know, I think as, as Jimmy has, has shown quite well, Jimmy Murray, the acting fire chief, that the day-to-day -day business can get done and does get done. Uh, the, when we run into some, some greater challenges, it's in doing those things that, that help to ensure the longer-term success of the department, the things that, you know, is, as dedicated as a part-time individual may be, there just isn't enough time to, to deal with some of the other issues as, you know, they, because they also, you know, need to, uh, to be with their family as well as uh, do their other full-time work. Uh, those areas are, are particularly in, in terms of a comprehensive training program uh, that, that attempts to, to meet the evolving needs of the department, some of the evolving regulations that the department needs to deal with, uh, as well as uh, a lot of issues of uh, liability, safety, some of, some of those concerns, certainly inspections. Uh, and, you know, I think when I started thinking about we're looking at about a half billion dollars of property here, we're looking at, uh, you know, almost 100 volunteers uh, who's, who risk their lives every time they, they respond to a call. And we're also looking at 8,800 residents whose, whose lives uh, the department is charged with protecting as well as all the visitors. So I think, you know, it's an enormous responsibility and it is one that uh, we, we ought to think about quite, quite carefully. Uh, the part of the survey working with the individual departments, I heard over and over that they want training. I heard over and over that they want a hands-on chief uh, who, who, who respond to calls. They want a very active uh, fire prevention program. They want very clear lines of authority. And they want good standing standard operating procedures. A particular concern of mine is that we, we really need exceptional record keeping uh, within the department, uh, particularly in the area of training uh, and what, is, what has been done and, uh, and what the needs are. Uh, th these are things that you know, I would see as top priorities uh, for the new chief. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other responsibilities I would like the chief to undertake. Uh, chief Webster, as you all know, is a sealer of weights and measures. Uh, I would like the new chief to serve as our compliance officer for the Americans with Disabilities Act. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but believe me, that is going to be one of the real major issues that the council is going to, to need to deal with as it deals with issues over the next couple of years. And one thing we have found is that a lot of in dealing with the, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, also very closely tie in with fire safety issues of access and egress as well as the availability uh, to fires. 
uh, s other positions would be worked out in working with some of the other department heads responsibilities in the area of overall safety as well as in some of the, the more general public safety areas which I addressed in my memo. So, you know, after a lot of thought and after meeting with many individuals and particularly the Board of Engineers who I think it's safe to say uh, no one uh, publicly opposed keeping the full-time position. Uh, you know, I, I think it's been a careful process and uh, what I would hope is that uh, you would author, you would essentially acknowledge receipt of the report, let me know if you do have any concerns, and then we would advertise the position uh, hopefully in this Sunday's paper and uh, bring uh, a candidate back for confirmation to the council uh, sometime uh, between now and the 1st of July. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would uh, someone like to move uh, Acknowledging the receipt of uh, our town manager's report. So moved. A second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, I had Would a comment. Go right on to discuss then. Well, I just had a comment. I would hope that when you, when you hire the individual that you don't give him so many other jobs that he won't be able to take care of the duties of the department. Because uh, as I read your memo, I think there's quite a few possibilities there. I want to have enough to make sure that he or, ch he or she is challenged and uh, that uh, we do receive sufficient value from the position. And I, uh, I appreciate your concern as well. I think one thing that needs to be recognized with the fire chief is that uh, there's a huge responsibility for attending a whole lot of meetings of the three companies and some of the training programs, the, the drills, and the, there's a lot, there's a lot to be done. I'm glad you got that he or she in there. <laughs> Chief, so Chief Murray, I, uh, I do see you sitting back there. Did you uh, want to make any comments before the vote on this particular item? I think many you found out well. You're sure now? You, you wear many hats in addition to your uh, acting chief status. We, we're appreciative of your uh, being in charge of our upcoming Memorial Day Parade on the 25th of uh, the month. All are invited to partake in the, that event. You sure you have nothing to say? Okay. Well, we appreciate all your work as well as your Family Fun Day efforts. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It is a 7-0 to zero vote. Thank you very much. The next item this evening is item 166, and this is uh, to consider authorizing an application for the main jobs creation bond and take any necessary action. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, citizens in June will be deciding whether or not to uh, establish a bond issue under a jobs creation bond. This is something that uh, was approved in the last days of the Maine legislature. Every community has an opportunity to uh, submit as many applications as the community would like. Uh, we, I have been, I did attend a meeting uh, with the director of the program last week. He met with the Cumberland County managers and he strongly recommends that any, any project come forward should have a leverage of one to one. Uh, in other words, 50-50 matching funds. Uh, beyond that, it does need to be in the construction or capital improvement, he defines that as something that could be bonded. Uh, and I don't know about an intercom system, Phyllis, but uh, it uh, should be something that could be bonded. Uh, the deadline is uh, right before the end of the month. Uh, a lot of the contractors have to be from uh, Maine uh, as much as possible, and it really does need to be tied into job creation, both uh, temporary and long term. So if there's any suggestions the counselors have uh, for specific applications, uh, uh, I'd be happy to submit an application. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, there's at least two here listed, number one and number three, that I think maybe could tie into one uh, as part of an overall project involving improving parking around the fort and fencing. And the second one, uh, the parking lot at the high school is, uh, uh, I need to discuss more with the school board uh, that that isn't it wasn't a long-term plan, but the most recent submittal 
to the planning board uh, shows a slightly alter alternate use of that that particular area uh, that uh, you know may or may not be able to incorporate a parking lot into it. The, the other point I should mention that is crucially important is that anything within this program, the plans need to be just about done. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to build a new fire station or something like that, but we don't have any plans for a new fire station, so we wouldn't be eligible. Councilor Cogsell. Yes, I was wondering if um, Mr. McGovern, in his consideration of projects for the um, board, considered the uh, reconstruction of the fish pond which has been on our wish list for a number of years. And that would also sort of be related to some of the fencing problems and it's in that general area. And that would be such a plus for the fort if we could improve that. Thank you. I'll put a grant in on that as well. Again, I would only remind uh, the citizens that uh, any and all of these grants would be entirely contingent upon uh, voter approval of the bond in uh, June's primary balloting, so please uh, come on June 9th and cast your vote. Uh, other input? Councilor Amaral. Um, what about the Shore Road uh, widening project? Yeah, I Shoulder project or whatever. Shoulder improvement? Yeah. Mr. Dow did indicate that projects that tend to be more material intensive and not labor intensive might run into problem, but you know, we can we can put it in and see what happens. The, the, the other problem with that, why, why I was hesitant, is if you looked at all the material, uh, we do need some wetland alterations permits on that, which we don't. Which Maybe we, don't we could have. do a portion. We could do a po portion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other suggestions this evening? Uh, well, since we have such good suggestions, could I entertain a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we authorize the manager to apply for uh, main jobs creation bond uh, proposal and to take it. Yeah. Second. That we apply for it. <laughs> okay, we do have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? vote is 7 to 0. Thank you very much. Item number 167 this evening is to consider the warrant for the June primary and take any necessary action. I will defer this item to our town clerk, Debbie Pizzo. Thank you. You should have in your packet the standard warrant calling for candidates uh, on the June primary to referendums and also a new Portland Water District trustee. This calls for the election Tuesday, June 9th at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium.